for our country. We think that our country needs some help. Uh, we're just so constantly bombarded with news of uh, trouble and corruption and perversion, and we just pray that you would uh, cause things to develop that uh, will help her to turn right and uh, to get a correct uh, perception again. Uh, she needs you, God, so much, and we need to know how to help her. So please give us wisdom and insight. Help us to be of help to her. Father, we think of our family, our church family here, the many people that are uh, connected to us. We pray for each one. Uh, oh, God, it sure be good to see them all here all at once. But uh, we just pray that you would be with them where they are and help them to grow. We think of the young ones, how they need to grow in their uh, capacity to understand that what, what's really important in life is, is to be a disciple of Jesus. So I pray that you would help them with that and help them to have the courage to make that kind of commitment that shows that, in fact, they belong to you. And, uh, Father, we pray that you be with us tonight as we study your word. Keep us aware and alert and uh, help us to do the job of work. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we are in 2 Kings, the uh, 14th chapter, 15th chapter tonight. Uh, we'll be working on uh, a couple other texts and chronicles. Um, I'm not connected in such a way that I'm... So I probably need to put that cursor over there in that box and see if that'll do it. Plus, I didn't get this one turned on, so it'll be hard for them to see if I don't do that.
doesn't think he was equal to David. Only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Now, you may remember we talked about high places last week. We keep talking about them, really. Uh, apparently, people did not want to go back to Jerusalem all the time to do their worshiping. So they developed some spots, and usually they were at the top of hills, or possibly high places could mean that they, they developed them at the top of at at the upper level of their house. But typically, you're going to find, we still do find, uh, uh, I'm trying to say, uh, archaeologically, we find uh, uh, places on the tops of hills where they used to worship, so we assume that that's primarily what it's meant. Now, it came about, as soon as the kingdom was firmly in his head, that is, in Amaziah's head, that he killed his servants who had slain the king, his father. Now, you kind of go, well, where was that? Well, you have to look all the way back to the last part of chapter 12 to get that. And so I, I just want to put it in for you so that you can review this. In chapter 12, we're backing up two chapters now. At the end of the 12, it says, now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? His servants arose and made a conspiracy and struck down Joash at the house of Milo as he was going down to Silla. For Josachar, and here you get the murderers, for Josachar, the son of Shimei, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Shomer, his servants struck him and he died, and they buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Amaziah, his son, became king in his place. So, it helps to kind of review things and remember, well, how did jo Joash die? Who, who's, who's, who's getting killed here? He killed his servants. Who, who, the, who are the servants that got, that he went back and killed? Well, then Josachar and Jehoshaphat. He went and killed them. Uh, but uh, in 2 Kings 14, 6, the next verse it says, But the sons of the slayers he did not put to death according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, as the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for the sons, nor the sons be put to death for the fathers, but each shall be put to death for his own sin. <clears throat> and I like that. I'm glad to see that he had reference to the Old Testament law and said, Hey, you know, I want to put these guys to death that killed my dad, uh, so I'm going to do that. But they have families. I'm not going to touch them. I'm just going to kill the ones that actually did the, the dirty deed, so to speak, and uh, get them uh, underground and uh, we'll go on with life. Verse 7, he killed of Edom in the valley of salt, 10,000, and took Silah by war and named it Joktil to this day. Uh, then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us face each other. Well, <clears throat> this is one of the interesting parts of studying your Old Testament is that when you get to this part of the Old Testament, 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles really intermesh. And sometimes 2 Chronicles, in this case, will give you information that 2 Kings doesn't. And I didn't really want to leave the story untold, uh, or the, you might say the complete story untold. So I've gone ahead and intermeshed uh, Second Chronicles tonight with your Second Kings story. So in Second Chronicles 25, it says, Moreover, Amaziah assembled Judah and appointed them according to their father's households, under commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds throughout Judah and Benjamin. And he took a census of those from 20 years old and upward and found them to be 300,000 choice.
descendants of Israel, nor with any of the sons of Ephraim. So he's just saying, look at uh, you, you all are good. Those 400,000, 300,000 men that you had, uh, that mighty army that you'd already directed, they were fine. But these people from up north, they're really not godly. They don't follow God the way you guys do, so don't include them. Uh, but if you do go, verse 8, do it. Be strong for the battle. God, yet God will bring you down before the enemy, for God has power to help and to bring down. So the prophet is very careful to tell uh, Amaziah, look, it, you, you can go to war, you can go take care of business, but be aware that uh, God, can, God can humble you before any enemy. Uh, be aware of that. Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the troops of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord has much more to give you than this. So <clears throat> then Amaziah dismissed them, the, the troops which came to him from Ephraim to go home, so their anger burned against Judah, and they returned him home in fierce anger. So I drew the arrows going the other way, so that you could see that these men who come down here to fight, did they get paid? I guess so. Uh, what are they mad about then? I'm not sure, but they're mad, and they went home mad. I think they were looking for a fight when they come down south, and they had to go home not getting to fight. So they're mad. They're upset and angry. Uh, now Amaziah strengthened himself and led his people forth and went to the valley of salt and struck down 10,000 of the sons of Seir. So I've drawn this uh, red line goes down here like this and then kind of these squiggly lines right here to show you, look, there's a big battle down here. And you can say, well, it must have been right down here at the, the, map, the end of the Dead Sea. I don't know, actually. The problem is I don't, I can't find the Valley of Salt. When I looked for it, uh, it doesn't seem to be there. But we know it was down south. We know that they, they were dealing with Edomites and uh, near Seir. So that's that's this area right in here. And uh, so I'm just going to say kind of arbitrarily uh, that that it's right here in this area. I may not be precisely correct, but it is in the general. It says the sons of Judah also captured 10,000 alive and brought them to the top of the cliff and threw them down from the top of the cliff so that they were all dashed to pieces. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? Uh, and then verse 13 says, But the troops of Amaziah, this is still in 2 Chronicles, the troops of Amaziah sent back from going with him to battle raided the cities of Judah from Samaria to Beth Horon and struck down 3,000 of them and plundered much spoil. So now you have our guys, our Judah guys have gone down here to fight uh, in this land uh, around Edom and uh, in the Valley of Salt. And while they're down there fighting here, uh, the guys that went back mad gather up at Samaria and then they trek down here uh, and they fight a fight right here at uh, Beth Horon. So, while they're gone, this, the, the guys that were so 
2 Chronicles happened just previous to this verse 8 that you find in 2 Kings 14. So we, we took a little parenthesis, so to speak, to get the whole story about what had happened before Amaziah says to uh, uh, Jehoash, he says, hey, let's, let's get together, Mr. King of the North, and we're going to fight. Well, now you get the reason he said it. It sort of comes out of the blue when you read it in 2 Kings without that Chronicles part. Uh, but now you know there had been this interchange of uh, somehow or another the people of the north took uh, umbrage at not being able to go down and fight the Edomites with the Judahites. And so uh, they came and uh, attacked what was then a uh, uh, Judaic city and uh, went off with people and so forth. And so when uh, Amaziah comes back from fighting down south, he's mad and he's going to go take on the northern tribes. And so Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash. We're back in 2 Kings 14, our kind of our, our tracker uh, text, the one that we stick with all the time. Uh, then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us face each other. Jehoash, king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, uh, The thorn bush, which was in Lebanon, sent to the cedar, which was in Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son in marriage. But there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon, and trampled the thorn bush. You have indeed defeated Edom, and your heart has become proud. Enjoy your glory and stay at home, for why should you provoke trouble, so that you, even you, would fall, and Judah with you? Uh, so that's that's the response. In other words, Amaziah is coming, come and said to Jehoahaz, Look, buddy, I'm mad because you, you've come and destroyed a city of ours, and uh, taking us on. Well, you're just going to have to take all of us on. And Jehoahaz says, well, basically, are you sure you want to do that? Because it looks to me like you're going to get beat. Uh, but Amaziah, verse 11, says, uh, would not listen. So Jeho Jehoash, I've got Jehoahaz, I'm sorry, jo Jehoash, Jehoash, king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. So you can see here that they basically, I just kept these conflicts going so you can kind of reference all of them. These are the two that kind of started this and went down to fight down here. Uh, the Israelites came down and took out a, what was then a Judah, a Judah city. And now they come to fight right here at Beth Shemesh, both of these uh, armies do. Judah was defeated by Israel, and they fled each to his tent. Then Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, the son of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh, and gave Jerusalem, and tore down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. About how far would that be? 400 cubits. Uh, cubits about 18 inches, something like that. So uh, it's kind of easy to, to calculate two yards if you do that. You just divide whatever cubits you have by two, and you have uh, the correct number of yards. So about 200 yards of wall were torn down. 
had some other written uh, document that they were in reference to uh, besides our book of Chronicles. So Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam, his son, became king in his place. Now, I'm trying to keep this uh, graph in front of you each time when we change a king because I want you to kind of lay it in here. Uh, this this uh, graph call or chart calls Jeroboam, Jeroboam II. Why would that be? Was he already had a Jeroboam? That's right. And Jeroboam, the first Jeroboam, how does he, how does he come into the in a certain sense, you might want to, uh, I would encourage this, that if you remember a Jeroboam, the one you want to remember is the first one. Because he is the guy, when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, came up and said, you know, I'm going to be way tougher even than my dad would. If you think my dad was tough, watch this. Well, at that point, Jeroboam came up and basically led off the northern ten tribes and uh, made the northern tribe and the southern tribes, uh, northern tribes and southern tribes separate from one another. So he developed a great division in the nation. This Jeroboam is still uh, Jeroboam, a real Jeroboam, because you'll see. Uh, Amazon, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived five, fifteen years after the death of jo Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? They conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to, he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and killed him there. So apparently, what somehow or another Amaziah fell into such disfavor that uh, the people in Jerusalem no longer wanted him to be king; they wanted him dead, and so they. Uh, decided to do this, and apparently he saw the, the sword coming, so to speak, early, and he took off and went to Lachish, which is down here, southwest of Judah, of Jerusalem, rather, and uh, that's where he ran to, but they caught up to him and killed him anyway. Uh, then they brought him on horses, and he was buried at Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. All the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his father. So uh, Elath, I don't remember where Elath is. Oh, I remember where it is. It's way down here. It's not able to be seen. Uh, it's actually right here uh, on the tip of uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, if you remember uh, the, the Red Sea down there, where you had two, or the Gulf of Suez down there, you had two big arms that stick up from it. One is the Red Sea, the other is the Gulf of Aqaba. Well, this is the Gulf of Aqaba, and uh, he's, he's hanging out, or he's not hanging out, he's come down here and apparently built this fort city up so that he has, again, uh, uh, access as a trade route to the, to the world, is what I'm thinking. Second Kings 15, in the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. And there you go. Azariah, son of Amaziah. Azariah right here. What we want to note right here is also on your paper you'll see that right Azariah is in parentheses and Uzziah is not. That's because Uzziah is the same guy as Azariah. 
Lord struck the king so that he was a leper on the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house while Jotham, the king's son, was over the household, judging the people of the land. And once again, 2 Chronicles has more to the story than that. 2 Chronicles tells you the backstory of how uh, Uzziah or Azariah uh, got to be a leper. What caused the Lord to be angry enough with him that he became a leper? It really has that. Even that has its own backstory. Uh, the the story of him getting leprosy has a backstory yet, and you'll find it here in First Chronicles 26. So, uh, and all the people it says, and all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. He built Elah and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his father. So that's the same basic story that you just heard uh, with the same city and everything. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehelia, a slightly different pronunciation, of Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Now he went out and warred against the Philistines, and broke down the wall of Gath, and the wall of Jephthah, and the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities in the, in the area of Ashdod and among the Philistines. So, uh, if you can remember some of these towns along here, this is Gath, this is the Philistine area, here's Ashdod. So uh, this is the area that he really began to uh, feel like he needed to make some uh, hay down here. He needed to come and push them around, I guess you might say, to get a hold of this area, area militarily. It was probably causing trouble with, Jude, with the rest of the people of Judah. That was pretty normal. That kind of thing seemed to happen with the Philistines a lot. And so he comes down and begins to uh, police it and to uh, take on some of their towns and just uh, dominate down in this region. My guess is he probably also built that wall back up. And that comes because of what you'll be reading in a little bit uh, about what he did in Jerusalem. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gurbal and the Mennonites. Uh, this is down uh, in this region down here. Uh, we don't really have a good uh, knowledge of where these places are uh, precisely, but uh, we believe that's where uh, they, they were. The Mennonites, I guess there actually is a a, uh, uh, an ancient ruins that they associate with men and now. Is it the same one? I don't know. Uh, the Ammonites also gave tribute to Uzziah and his fame extended to the border of Egypt for he became very strong. So you can imagine that uh, all this area that you can see here and some further down this way uh, Uzziah really began to push things around and make, make room for the people of God again. And uh, he pushed them all the way back to Egypt. And uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. It says the Ammonites also gave tribute to Uzziah and his fame extended to the war of Egypt where he became very strong. Here's the Ammonites over here. So we, we have them on our map. We have this kind of reddish pink area that we call Israel, and then it comes down here and it kind of uh, mixes up with Moab. So you know this boundary was uh, fluid a lot of the time. But what we don't feel from the way our map is put together is that a lot of this area in here is fluid. Because Judah now is coming over here and extending power into this area as well. And uh, <clears throat> making making a, a dominant uh, presence in that area. So uh, for for the duration of his kingdom, anyway, uh, he's really gotten control of the the southern part of the country. It says moreover, Uzziah built 
towers in Jerusalem, and at the corner gate, and at the valley gate, and at the corner of buttress, and fortified them. So I'm assuming he cleared up the problem with the, with the wall. He built towers in the wilderness and hewed many cisterns. Why would he build towers in the wilderness? What would a tower be? Why would you have it? Yes, exactly. You would be looking out for uh, enemies to see what was going on. It gives you a, a bird's eye view kind of of the area, and you can you can begin to to assess uh, what your threat level is all the time. And I'm sure probably had some sort of communication worked out so that uh, he could rapidly know uh, what was going on in any part of his country. Built towers in the wilderness, hewed out many cisterns. So, uh, for he had much livestock, both in the lowland and in the plain. So uh, he, he made sure that his people and his animals could get water. He also had plowmen and vine dressers in the hill country and the fertile fields, for he loved the soil. Uh, so he really liked agriculture and he worked hard at it to see to it that his people could really exploit the uh, countryside agriculturally. Moreover, Uzziah had an army ready for battle, which entered combat by division, according to the number of their muster, prepared by Jael, the scribe, and Maaseah, the official under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's officers. The total number of the heads of the households of valiant warriors was 2,600. Under their direction was an elite army of 307,500, who could wage war with great power to help the king against enemy. Moreover, Uzziah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and sling stones. This is kind of impressive to me because uh, one of the things that you, you can find in the Old Testament is from time to time the people of God are in predicaments where they really don't have much other than you know their hay forks and so forth to, to fight with. And uh, Isaiah made sure that they were well armored up. They were ready to fight. They had weapons. And uh, it wasn't uh, just a bunch of country bunkings going out trying to, to fight people, uh, professional armies. He had real army ready to fight. Uh, in Jerusalem, he made engines of war, invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great stones. So he began to make Jerusalem fairly bristle with power and uh, make sure that he could, he actually had some kind of machinery, it sounds like, that uh, he could launch uh, arrows or uh, great stones like, uh, uh, you know, you see once in a while a trebuchet or a, what's the other name for that? Catapult. Catapult. A catapult. Uh, perhaps something like that, I don't know. But in any case, uh, he could throw great stones with what he had built. Hence his fame spread afar. He was marvelously helped until he was strong. But when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly and he was unafraid, or un unfaithful rather, to the Lord. Might have been unafraid. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. What's wrong with that? Because only a priest can do that. Right. Then Azariah the priest entered after him, and with eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men, they opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. So, uh, fascinating that here is a a man who has empowered a kingdom much like they had not been empowered since the days of Solomon. And uh, now when he comes to, to uh, sort of worship in his own temple, he can't do it the way he wants to because the priests still retain their dignity and their, uh, their worth and their sense of, of direction of God. And it's fascinating to me that he thought this because he himself was a man who had uh, really kind of led out in uh, making sure that people uh, were, were coming after God properly. Uh, they said, get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honor from the Lord God. But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priests, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the altar of incense. So, uh, sudden 
be able to talk to people and, and entertain people in the king's court and so forth. He takes over that role. Uh, so these, these kingdoms overlap. And this is a nice way of showing how they do that. And uh, I really appreciate our uh, creator for that, the God who created this. And you can also notice that uh, for really quick reference, uh, the, the, the kings with a check mark and a halo beside them, they are relatively or generally good kings, and then the kings with the little devil beside them are not. So uh, that kind of kind of helps you get a feel for uh, what the kings were like so far as the the writers of uh, Second Kings and Second Chronicles uh, took it. Okay, verse eight, chapter fifteen of Second Kings. In the thirty-eighth year of Azariah, or Azariah, king of Judah, Uzziah, uh, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel and Samaria for six months. Boy, that wasn't very long, was it? You notice that the kings that do evil don't last very long. <laughs> That's right. The ones with those halos have longer reign. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Well, because God's with them. Well, I think that's an awful lot of it. I think that God's with them. I think that the people are with them. Uh, I think people appreciate a good king. Um, the sad part is that they always did right in the eyes of the Lord, but they never got rid of all the idols. And right. people still worship the idols in the high places. That is correct. Because the high places were not good things. <laughs> that is correct. And if you look, it's interesting to me, if you look along the, the left-hand side of the Israelite kings, uh, there really aren't any of them that come out as good kings. Uh, and they all do have relatively short uh, reigns. Right. So, yeah, that, that works out that way. Uh, he did evil, this is uh, uh, Zechariah, did evil in the sight of the Lord as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel sin. Then Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him before the people and killed him and reigned in his place. It's funny how, you know, to, to kind of dovetail into the thing that you said, if you, if you kill people, there's a good chance that you're going to get killed. I mean, that's, that that's just stands to, to observe, so to speak. Now the rest of the Acts of Zechariah, behold, there are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. This is the word of the Lord which he spoke to Jehu, saying, Your sons to the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. And so it was. Uh, Shalom, the son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now they start talking about him as Uzziah. They quit talking about him as Azariah. Now they're talking about him as Uzziah. Uh, so this is a very kind of, it's, there's a confusion of pronunciation or or spelling, you might say, in 2 Kings on, on a number of uh, kings, and uh, uh, Uzziah Azariah is uh, not alone in this, but here, here he is. Uh, Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah, and he reigned one month in Samaria. So that was uh, even shorter. <laughs> one month. Then Menahem, son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and struck Shalom, son of Jabesh, in Samaria and killed him and became king in his place. So uh, down here in this uh, really condensed area, you've got Zechariah, then you've got Shalom for a month, now you've got Menahem. And he does reign for uh, a considerable uh, amount of time. Now the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy, which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Then Menahem struck Tifsah and all who were in it and its borders from Tirzah, because they did not open to him. Therefore he struck it and ripped up all its women who were with child. Nice guy. Uh, Tirzah. Borders from Tirzah. Right here is Tirzah, or at least what they think might be Tirzah. And if you want to try to figure out what uh, Tifzah is, it must be that there was a region known as Tifzah in this area. 
years in Samaria. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart all his days from the sons of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin. Then Menahem exacted the money from Israel, even from all the mighty men of wealth, from each man fifty shekels of silver, to pay the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria returned and did not remain there in the land. And I put the, I found a map of Assyria because I want you to see what was going on uh, in this period of time. The Assyrian Empire here, and they've drawn the borders of the Assyrian Empire in 824, and it was growing. It was a kingdom that was growing. Later on, in 671, it's really spread out everywhere here. Uh, so, but during this time, uh, they probably made an incursion down from this area up in here, down into Israel, and uh, just demanded, hey, if you want to keep on going without a lot of trouble from us, you're going to pay us. And so uh, they made them pay uh, a certain uh, tribute every year, in all likelihood every year, uh, while Menahem was king. Now the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Now Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah, his son, became king in his place. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, son of Menahem became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned two years. So here's your Pekahiah down here for two years. Uh, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sons of Jeroboam, son of Debat, which he made Israel sin. Then Pekah, son of Remaliah, his officer, conspired against him and struck him in Samaria in the castle of the king's house with Argal and Aria. And with him were 50 men of the Gileadites. And he killed him and became king in his place. So another uh, coup. He takes out the king. And now you get uh, Pika, this guy right here, who's, uh, becoming, who's become king. Now the rest of the acts of Pika and I had only dead the whole there written in the book. Uh, the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Uh, in the 752nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, son of Remaliah, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 20 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sons of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, here it is, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Aijan, Abelbeth Mahatha, and Genoa, and Kedesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. Now the real suffering of the kingdom of Israel has begun. Uh, this, this is this area. I've shown where the cities are, but some of those areas are not just cities. Uh, Naphtali is this whole area up here. Gilead is, strictly speaking, this whole area over here. So people were being uh, rounded up, captured, and taken off. Uh, and these are people who disappeared. They, uh, they, they no longer are identifiable in the areas where they went. Uh, so that's, that's the beginning of a, of a terrible uh, destruction of the northern kingdom uh, when Tiglath Pileser comes down. And Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, son of Ramaliah, struck him and put him to death, and became king in his place in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Now the rest of the acts of Pekah all he did, all they're written in the book of Chronicles, the son of kings of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, became king. So that just kind of helps you realize that the, the, the southern kingdom's having to go on during this time. I like our little picture of, uh, of the uh, kingdom of Assyria because Judah is this little light yellow area, not quite truly yellow because they were so uh, sort of dominated, as it were, by the Assyrian kingdom. Uh, but they were still their own country. It says he was 25 years old when he became king, uh, Jotham was. He reigned 16 years in 
king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. So what happened was, I believe, that uh, our Assyrian uh, uh, dominance up here meant that he, he marshaled the king here and the king up here and caused them to come down and put pressure on uh, Judah. So that's, that's what that is all about. And Jonathan slept with his father, and was buried with his father, so the city of David, his father, and Ahaz, his son, became king in his place. There, we ran through that last part pretty rapidly, but I think it was fairly easy, that part, in that uh, you, you just really can begin to see that northern push from the Assyrians coming down, and now the next stories you have will be uh, about how Judah 